Thank you again for coming. Uh, any veterans we have here, please stand. Thank you. Thank you for your service. I have a few people would like to acknowledge this morning. Roger Bridgewater from Precinct 3. Roger. And Ken Klingerman from Precinct 3. He's Ken. <laughs> Claudia Canales with Wesley Hunt's office. Thank you for what you do. Uh, the Christian Business Luncheon Board, would you please stand? With your mouth full, of course. <laughs> I want to recognize uh, first-time visitors. I know we have at least a couple here. First-time visitors. Thank you. Welcome. I want to recognize Rancho Grande for feeding us today. I know the food's going to be good. And our friend Janetta had a funeral to go to today, so Philip has stepped in to video, to video our session. Thank you, Philip. So our luncheon is on the second Tuesday of every month here at uh, the Beckendorf Center. And we have some future speakers coming up. We get some really great ones coming. Uh, next month will be Ron Hinn. In June, Michelle He. Tiananmen Square a survivor is going to be coming. In July, Lynn Nagel. August, we're going to have a student panel. This will be a first for us. We'll, we have four students, and they're going to talk about what it's like being a student today, uh, being a Christian in the, uh, in the academia. So that's going to be really a really good session. And then in September, one of our uh, favorite and, and most popular speakers is going to be here, Mary Burton, who heads the Pregnancy Center. Uh, last time she spoke, uh, there were tears at every table. I know that. And then in October, Dr. Scott Scripling will be here. And uh, he's also a very, very popular speaker. And then, of course, in November, we'll have a veterans program. And in December, the Concordia Lutheran Choir will be here to uh, entertain us again. Great programs coming. It's, um, as Paul mentioned, Laurie couldn't be here. No, Laurie is a member of our board here as well. I, uh, too, serve on the board here of a Christian business luncheon. And it's one of those things that, how do you really introduce somebody that don't need any introduction? You know, we all know the, uh, the clients are, are Tom Ball. So when you think of Tom Ball, you certainly have to think of the clients. But I wanna say a couple of things here that you guys uh, may or may not know. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, are we have any Aggies out here? Stand up and be counted. <laughs> yeah. Judge Bridgewater, come on, man. You're just from Crockett. There you go. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, I'm an ag as well, and uh, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce Jeffrey here. I've got a little cheat note here, okay? Uh, Jeffrey, of course, now serves as the CEO of Tomball Regional Healthcare Foundation, and they do a lot of great work out here in Tomball, as you guys all know. Uh, he, uh, for years, was the owner of uh, the Klein Brother Foods, which we all remember and know. He served on the uh, Congressman Kevin Brady uh, Armed Service Academy appointment board as well. You know, uh, he has a BBA in management uh, with honors, of course, from Texas A&M. <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey and Tracy are great friends of ours. They have uh, three kids and uh, they attend Trinity Klein Lutheran, is that correct? Help me welcome Jeffrey Klein. Well, I thank you for having me today. Uh, when Paul uh, contacted me a while back to speak, he said, can you talk about your work with the Tomball Regional Health Foundation? And I love sharing what we do at the Health Foundation, uh, and then he said that I need you to tell me about how you got there, and just tell us about yourself, and I need about 45 minutes. And so that was a, a bit of a surprise. I'm used to about a 15-minute PowerPoint. So uh, I'm going to extend that uh, at Paul's uh, urging to tell you a little bit how I got here and 
and, uh, and what I'm doing here. So uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, you know I love talking about the history of the area. Uh, obviously, uh, there is an area north of Houston called the Klein area, so there is uh, a little bit of history to share there. And so I was trying to think of a fun way to, to do that, um, and I was thinking about how I got into the, this position, and I realized that I never set out to be uh, the CEO of the Tomball Regional Health Foundation. I was always in the family grocery business. And so as I look back in my life, though, I see how God was, was sending me that way the entire time. I just never knew it. And, and then I look back, and I look back for generations. He has been sending me and members of my family into roles of, of leadership and community service. And so I, I am going to, to go back a ways, and I thought a fun way to do that today would uh, to show you the hats that I wear, that I've worn, and, and how every hat we all wear, it turns into to something that, that God's leading and directing. So uh, you'll either find this really corny, or you may find it entertaining. I don't know. And then Paul said I had to do a little singing and dancing. I don't know about that. We'll see. So let me set up my hats here. All right, the first hat. <laughs> well, people often ask you don't know us, uh, and I, I, I find this all the time. Are you in relation to the Kleins that started the Klein community? Uh, yes, I am. And let's think back to the 1851, and that's when there was such a, a huge German migration. Not only uh, my great-great-grandfather came over in 1851, but uh, my, my mom's great-great-grandfather, um, my, uh, my grandmother's uh, great-grandfather. So there was this huge German migration in the early 1850s to Texas. And if you look at the geography of Texas, kind of the German belt or sausage belt, as I call it, starts on the east with the Klein community, and it goes all the way uh, out toward Fredericksburg. And so you have to think back at that time, how bad was it that you would say, and, and, and here's, here's our story, and it's probably similar to other stories, my great-great-grandfather, Johannes Adam Klein, he was known as Adam, goes to his fiance in 1851 and says, I've got this great idea. Let's elope, and we're going to go and board a ship. We're going to go to New Orleans. We're going to go live with your half-brother that you met one time when you were just a small infant before he left for the United States, and we're going to start a new life. You'll never see your family again. How does that sound? Apparently, he was a great salesman because she went for it, and they aborted the Elizabeth Hamilton. They sailed for New Orleans somewhere along the way. Uh, they got married by the ship's captain, came into the port of New Orleans, which was the second largest port in the United States at that time, took a steamship up to St. Louis, and ended up in Herman, Missouri. Think of the things they saw in 1851, coming across the ocean on a sailing ship, going up pre-Civil War up, up the Mississippi, and then he gets there to Herman, Missouri, to her half-brother, and he says, you stay here. I'm going to San Francisco to the gold rush with some guys I don't know. I mean, she's got to be thinking, what a cornball that I'm married to here. So they go across, and I mean, and you think about this. This is by the time this, 1852. I mean, that's Buffalo and Indians. I mean, this is, this is rugged country. He goes to San Francisco area uh, and actually is, has some success, gets a little gold, and for whatever reason, did not want to go back to Missouri. I don't know if it was the land prices, if he saw too many rocks or what. But he boarded a ship um, in San Francisco, went to Panama, walked across uh, Panama, talk, took another ship up to Galveston. And he had sent word by that time for, uh, for Frederica to meet him in Galveston. And they headed up to the Big Cypress area north of Houston, where he bought a land grant from the family of uh, one of Sam Houston's soldiers. And so... In 1854, he bought this land grant, and so that was the first Klein to be in the Klein community. Uh, so he was obviously one of the very early settlers up here, and um, I'm not sure if it, maybe going to the gold rush, he had learned more English than some of the others, but when there was a time that the, uh, the early settlers and the Strocks, the Tices, the Dorries, the Brills, all those early families came together, uh, but they needed a post office. So Adam Klein starts ding dong and starts bugging the postal service that he wants a post office. And so they named it the Klein Post Office. 
And so whether that it was already the Klein community, we're not sure, or if the post office said we've got to name it after somebody and this Klein guy keeps writing us. But anyway, that is now the Klein area. And so, you know, that's, I don't know exactly what year that was, but about 1860, he got his citizenship. And that's also an important year because that's when my great grandfather was born. So, so new hat. Adam Klein was a weaver by uh, trade, and so he learned to farm, but it was really his son, my great grandfather. And you're probably thinking that's, uh, uh, ought to be more generations in there, but my people seem to live a long time. Uh, they all have a bunch of kids. Uh, I think my great-great-grandfather had 10 kids. My great-grandfather had eight. My grandfather had nine. So there's a very few generations, but there's a lot of us. And so John Klein, uh, like everybody else in the Klein community at the time, he was, uh, you know, dairy, uh, cattle ranching, cotton, truck farming. So he was a farmer. And so my, my grandfather, uh, uh, Adam Klein, not Adam Klein, Alec Klein, or A.B. Klein, um, he's born in 1898. Now, how many of you had a grandfather born in the 1800s? So there's a few of you. Um, so that's kind of weird to stand up here today in 2024 and think your grandfather was born in, in the 1800s, but he was. And so he's looking around as a young man, and he, he looks around the family farm, and he's like, there's only so many ways you can split the farm. And uh, after several summers of picking cotton in, in the heat of Texas summer, he decided that maybe Farming was not for him. So that's when the, the farming hat started to come off the Kleins. And so my grandfather, Alec Klein, and this is actually his hat, which I think is really cool. This is from the 1850s, I'm mean, sorry, 1950s. Uh, he started uh, Klein's General Merchandise in spring uh, uh, by the railroad tracks in, uh, what was that, 1922, so at age 24. Uh, he got into the grocery business. And uh, as many general merchandises at the time did, he uh, then started selling caskets and clothing. And so before he knew it, he was in the funeral business as well, and kind of back in, into the funeral business. Well, 1933, what happened in Tomball? This is participation. What happened in Tomball, 1933? Oil. So my grandfather looks at the railroad there in spring, and he's like, this is a good place but oil's the, oil's the way to go. And so he moves um, his store, or actually he has two stores. He has one in Spring and one in Tomball in 1933. And after a couple of years, he's like, you know what? I'm gonna move the family over to uh, Tomball because the roads weren't great back then. And we're gonna live in Tomball and we're gonna run uh, the general merchandise there in Tomball. So as uh, Joe Sturdivant knows, uh, the team building was our store on the main street of Tomball uh, from 1933 to 1969. And so my grandfather ran that. He was a serial entrepreneur. He uh, opened a feed store, he opened a funeral home, uh, and he, he had several different businesses and was very active in the community, just like his, his dad was and his dad before him. Um, you know, that was just kind of the, the thing you did in the, in, the, in the Klein family. You were a leader, whether it was in your church or your community. And my grandfather was certainly that person as well. So uh, 1933, my dad is born. Um, 1935, they moved to Tomball. Uh, did anybody know where the, uh, the old post office was, the old Sonic was on Main Street? Um, I know some of y'all do. So right on the Main Street of Tomball uh, is where my dad grew up. Uh, and there again, Tomball was more rural. I mean. People had chickens and cows, you know, I was, my kids were raising rabbits for FFA at one point, and my dad's back there helping them. I'm like, what do you know about raising rabbits? He said, I raised rabbits in the backyard. We had a big family. So even in a big family, in a grocery family, everybody contributed. And so he said, that's what I did. So. So 1933, my dad's born, and in 1957, he marries my mom. Uh, they met at Sam Houston. And uh, to tell you how this area has grown, in 1957, she was the fourth grade teacher for the Klein School District. So it has grown a bit since then. And so I, I wear this construction hat because dad uh, took over the, the, the family grocery store. He literally finished college, and within five months, his dad passed away. So here he is, 22 years old, and he's running a supermarket. Uh, see, Cousin Lori's not here, so I'll tell this story. Uh, 
So uh, Lori's, uh, Lori's dad, Howard, was the attorney in town, and my uh, dad's oldest brother was Teddy, and Teddy kind of did the funeral home, and dad kind of did the supermarket. Well, when my grandfather died, he was the only licensed mortician in the Klein funeral family. And so he all of a sudden dies unexpectedly of a heart attack, and dad and Teddy look at each other and they're like, we've got a problem. We can't sign the paperwork. And so um, they figured at that time uh, the county was probably very inefficient uh, in keeping up with things like that. So Uncle Teddy goes to mortuary school. Dad stays in Tomball, runs the funeral home while Teddy's at mortuary school. And in the meantime, if anybody passed away, A.B. Klein was still signing all of the death certificates. <laughs> looks a whole lot like Robert Klein's signature. <laughs> and, and true to form, they never figured that out. And it was years later uh, that dad was showing me in some, some paperwork that uh, uh, Uncle Howard had, had saved that uh, said, whose signature is that? I said, well, it's not your dad's. <laughs> so anyway, uh, my dad uh, marries. Um, and in 1970, I'm born. Dad, uh, by this time, and I, that's why I have the construction hat on, by this time, he had moved to the edge of town where the current VA is, that was our Klein supermarket, and he built that in 1969, right across the street, uh, Teddy built the funeral home. And so uh, old timers said, boys, y'all are moving too far out of town. That's hard to believe right now, isn't it? Um, but he was a builder, and, and he built that store, and he added on to it twice, and uh, we uh, were on, supposed to be on Main Street, and that location from 1969 to 2010. So, it was at his, at his feet that I learned the grocery business and then just, just life in general. So a few of you remember the old style grocery hat. So I grew up at Klein's supermarket sacking groceries and doing all sorts of things in the grocery business. Uh, I guess I was probably eight or 10 years old. Bruce, you probably remember having my little red apron up there sacking groceries. and. Um, uh, and I, I often on my talks, I diverge on things. Bruce's mom and my dad went to high school together, and they would ride back and forth to Sam Houston together. And then uh, Bruce's mom played the piano for a group called the Philos that my mom was a member of, was a singer. So when she started dating Robert, she already knew our Leah Bruce. And then uh, later, for 25 years, those two ladies led the singing for the children at Salem Lutheran Church. Uh, our Leah was a wonderful piano player. Mom was a great singer. And those two, for 25 years, uh, and that goes back to 1956 at Sam Houston. So anyway, I started in the grocery business with my dad as a little kid. And I eventually attended Tomball High School and uh, graduated there uh, in 1988. But one of the things I wanna, I wanna just kinda digress a little bit, one of the things that was very important to the early German settlers in this, this whole area was um, religious freedom. That's one of the reasons they left Germany. Um, you know, if you think of the history of Germany at that time, if your prince was Catholic, you were Catholic. If he was Lutheran, you were Lutheran. You, you, you didn't get a lot of choice on the, what you did, who you worshiped, how you worshiped, and it was very big within the Klein family to have Christian education. So when they came here, um, the, the early settlers of the Klein community would go back and forth to Rose Hill to go to church at Salem Lutheran Church, because that was started back in the 1850s. Well, 1874, my great-great-grandfather and seven other men in the, the Klein area said, we're going to form a church. And so Trinity Lutheran Church, which I still attend today, and in which this Sunday we're going to celebrate 150 years, which is pretty cool, I think. So, and, and, what, and one of the first things they did when they built the church is they also started teaching classes. So my grandfather, my great-grandfather, uh, they were educated at Trinity Lutheran School. Uh, my dad was in Tomball, so he went to Zion Lutheran School, and then Zion and Salem for a time had Tomball Lutheran School where I went to. So Christian education was always very important in our family. And then my kids, I have three children, um, and they went to Trinity Lutheran School pre-K through eighth grade. So, you know, that Christian education is just very important to our family. And so, but, you know, I, I really had a great time at Tomball High School, and, uh, and as Larry mentioned, from there I went to Texas A&M. So I've worn this hat many times since then. Uh, when I went to a and I, I spent some time with the uh, singing cadets there. 
Some may boast a brow is bold. And I got to go and do that. Uh, here we go. Got to spend some time going around the state in some foreign countries singing with the singing cadets. But it was, uh, it was a great time at A&M. And I'm, uh, uh, although I wasn't there at the same time, uh, my beautiful wife Tracy is also an A&M graduate. And I have two, uh, two children who are at A&M right now. And I'll have a third at A&M uh, come the fall. So we're going to have three Aggies at one time up there. So it's going to be a good time. Um, so um, and one of the things that, that you know, I learned at Tomball, at, you know, and working in the store and, and going to Tomball High School is a love of your, your home folks, the love of the community. And so except for my four years at A&M, I've always lived in Tomball, which is very unique. And, and it's very unique to have a family that you still go to the same church that your great-great-grandfather founded, you know. And, and you, know, you, think, you know, you think of how do you build your life, you know, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking or shifting sand. And so, you know, when you build that type of foundation through the family, I consider it a great blessing uh, to have that foundation because a lot of people don't get that foundation. And so, you know, people, you know, uh, talk about, you know, is it, when did you start going to church? When did, you know, anything like that? There was never a time I didn't go to church. There was never a time that we didn't pray before a meal. Uh, there was never a time we didn't eat dinner together. So is that stability through life? And so uh, I think that really pays off uh, in, that, in that way. And so I spent my time at A&M, came back, went to work back for Dad in the store. So by then, we were Klein's Food and Pharmacy. So, and, and, that, and see, that's one of those little things along the way. I didn't know I was being prepared for the job that I'm in now because I spent a lot of time uh, in the pharmacy and working with the pharmacist. Uh, that was before you had to be licensed to be a pharmacy tech. Dad said one day, you're going to work in the pharmacy, and so I was in the pharmacy. And so as I've been in the health foundation and things come up, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm HIPAA, yeah, for, you know, all these things that I didn't, didn't know I was being prepared for, God was preparing me along the way. He was preparing me to love my community. He was preparing me at A&M. A&M preaches the other education. Larry knows this. Be a leader. I've never been in part of an organization that there was not an Aggie on the board. A&M preaches leadership. Um, you know, and, and, and the Aggies are, are known for their leadership. When Point de Hoc was taken by the 2nd Ranger Battalion at Normandy, it was Colonel James Earl Rudder, A&M class of 32, who was the first person to take that. So that was always preached at A&M, and, and then it backed up what I'd learned at home. If you see a need, you do it. If you see a need in your community, you take care of it. Same thing with my dad with the construction hat. Not only did he build a store, but he was uh, very active at it, Salem Lutheran Church. He was uh, on the building committee, and probably with Bruce's dad, uh, they, built what the, they built the family center, they built the church, and they built the school. So... He was a builder of things. If he saw a need, he jumped in and, and did it. Well, when you get married, you, you take on other responsibilities, like the yard. And so uh, Tracy and I married in 96. Uh, she uh, is, uh, grew up in Tomball her whole life. And uh, so we just, uh, there was enough age difference. We were never in school together, but uh, uh, we were lucky enough to, uh, to meet uh, she was working uh, for Klein Bank, which was owned by John Klein, who's a dad's cousin, and, uh, and they had a branch, if you remember back in the store, if you uh, I know David McIver does, um, and so she was working in the branch of the store, and I was lucky enough to meet her and marry her, and we now have, like I said, three, three wonderful children. So what do you do when you have kids? You jump in and you help. I don't know anything about baseball. I don't know how to watch the Astros, but uh, I know how to uh, take orders from people who do. And in fact, uh, Sarah Dill, who's here with me today, Sarah's in my office here at the Health Foundation. Her husband, Alan, and I coached baseball. Well, we stood by bases and somebody else told us how to coach it. But, but you jump in and you help with your kids. And that is so helpful to them as they're growing up to see mom and dad out there working with them. So whether it was Cub Scouts or baseball or whatever, we jumped in, we worked with our kids. So our kids grew up at Trinity Lutheran School. We've attended there since 1996. 
And, uh, you know, when you have those families that work together, that have the same philosophy of not only education, but the importance of putting Christ at the center of your life, it really makes, it really makes uh, a big difference for your kids. And so we're always very privileged to do that. Um, and so there again, you know, when I was asked to serve on boards, I've never asked to serve on a board. I've always been asked. I always felt like if somebody wanted me to serve, I would. And so I've had the opportunity to serve on different boards and committees at Trinity. And, and there again, your kids see you do that. And that's so important. Well, about 2010, uh, Dad uh, got out of the grocery business. And uh, what we have now is the VA clinic and what used to be our grocery store. Uh, but I uh, uh, decided that I was not quite finished with the grocery business. And so I started uh, my company, which I went back to the original 1922 name, uh, to Klein Brothers. And so Klein Brothers, um, I did gourmet foods, jams, jellies, salsas. Uh, and sold those, ironically, to Kroger and H-E-B. Uh, so it was kind of funny. Um, and I did that about, oh, I guess about the start of COVID. I was kind of getting burned out on what I was doing. Um, and I think COVID was kind of that, that final straw when everybody's staying home and doing their thing. And if you're in the grocery business, you're still in the grocery stores every day. You're still out there, um, you know, weekends, whatever it takes to, to uh, get out in the stores. And so I was having a breakfast uh, with one of our pastors at Trinity, uh, Pastor John uh, Cordray, and I was telling him about my frustrations. I said, I'm just not really feeling it like I used to. And he said, well, maybe God's telling you something. I was like, oh, maybe he is. I said, what's he telling me? He said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, John, you're a pastor. You should know. He said, no, if I knew, I wouldn't be having breakfast with you. I'd be on my book tour. <laughs> so he's like, Okay. I said, um, what do I do? He said, well, you, you need to pray about it. He said, he said, if God's trying to move you a certain direction, he will, he will let you know. And so, uh, and another suggestion he made is he said, I want you to go to talk to one of our other pastors, to Pastor, pastor Gene Johnson. Um, interesting thing about Pastor Gene, before he was a pastor and was or, uh, went to uh, seminary, he was Clay Walker's tour manager of all things. So you're like, why would you walk away from being the tour manager at the time of one of the hottest country acts in America? And he said, because I wasn't feeling it. I'm like, ah, okay, he does understand me. And so I kept praying through that, and, and nothing was becoming apparent to me. And then um, I was at an event. Uh, my wife uh, is the uh, senior uh, program manager for community engagement with uh, Houston Methodist. And so she would go to a lot of different events, and so she was in, invited me to an event. I was actually over at Frost Bank. Uh, David McIver was probably there. And um, the Tomball Regional Health Foundation was presenting a check to someone. I think it was the Pregnancy Center uh, with Mary Burton. And I thought, that's really cool. Um, I wonder if they have any openings uh, on their board. I knew they had a board that, that did that, and my mom had been on the hospital board years before. So I went and talked to, uh, to Vicki Clark, who was the board chairman, and she said, actually, I think we're going to have an opening coming up. Uh, I'll let you know, and you can apply for that position. Okay. So I started studying and, and going online and trying to learn a little bit about them and visit with some people who knew something about what the foundation did. And I thought, this is really cool. This health foundation is really cool. I really want to be on their board. Well, in the meantime, before that opening appeared, uh, uh, the CEO of the health foundation passed away. And it hit me. I think I'm going to apply for his job. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go talk to Vicki, and she's going to tell me that's stupid. And she didn't. And then I went and talked to Bruce Hillegeist, who's, who's trying to run away. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Bruce, I, I said, what do you think about me applying for that? I said, I I've never run a foundation. I don't know anything about a foundation. I've been on some boards of foundations. He said, I think you ought to apply. I went to Pastor, to Pastor Gene, and I said, uh, Pastor Gene, what do you think? He said, I think God's telling you to apply. And so I started looking back at all the things I'd done, and I thought, all these hats that I've worn for something like this actually make a lot of sense. When you're in the grocery business, everybody eats. Poor people eat, rich people eat, short people, tall people, old and young, everybody eats. So you learn a lot about people in the grocery business. When you have a pharmacy, you learn about empathy for people and their health care needs. When they walk up to the counter and they like, I can't afford that. Or they have three prescriptions, but they can only pick up one that day. And, and I knew from the store and working with, with uh, cause we worked with Tamagua, we worked with team and different, different food drives and, and medical care issues. So you learned empathy. 
And so I started looking back at all these things and I, you know, volunteering at different things. Well, what about kids? Well, I, I'd been the Cub Scout leader. Well, what about sports events? Well, I coached, kind of coached baseball. Um, you know, and I, and I looked back and I'm like, okay, all these little crumbs have been dropped along the way. What if I put them all together? And so I did. I went and applied and they had a, um, this national search firm. And I thought, okay, they're, I'm never going to get past them because they're going to kill me. And they interviewed me and I was telling them all the stuff I'd done in the grocery business and I'm thinking, how, how am I going to relate this to the foundation? And the lady interviewing me said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. My dad owned his own grocery store. You do have, you've got a lot of skills, don't you? I said, you know about marketing? I said, yes, I do. I said, you know about accounting? Yes, I do. I said, I'm not good at any of these things, but I know a little bit about a lot of things. And he said, yeah, I know. That was my dad. And I thought, wow, of all the people to interview me. And then so I made the, 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 the final three. And so I go to interview with the board. And um, I'm sitting there, and I'm interviewing with them. And uh, anybody in here know Jim Ross? Board, he's our board chair. I know you know Jim. Um, how many of you know that before he was an accountant, he was a manager for HEB? And so when I talked to him about the things that I knew how to do, he turned to the board member and said, yeah, yeah, he knows, he knows how to do that. And I'm like, of all the odds, I, and, and they didn't even know he had ever worked for HEB. They found out in the interview. So I'm thinking, God is just dropping these crumbs along the way. And so eventually... I put on this hat of the Tomball Hospital Authority. And so now I'm going to tell you about it. So what is the Tomball Hospital Authority? Or more specifically, what is the Tomball Regional Health Foundation? Well, it's our mission to promote wellness and improve health status for all residents in our communities through programs that enhance access to health care, preventative care, and health education. OK, let's look at the history of it. Guess who was the first chairman of the Tomball Hospital Authority? My grandfather, A.B. Klein. I was recently out of the sunrise service at Trinity Lutheran Cemetery, and on his footstone, it put on one of the things he has on there, and I took a picture of it, I want to show it to my board. Clearly his kids knew this was, this was important to him, founder, Tomball Hospital. Many of you might have known Dr. Norman Graham. 1951, my grandfather hires Norman Graham as the uh, chief uh, of surgery and chief of everything. We only had one doctor. Norman Graham. Norman Graham uh, served Tomball for over 60 years. Um, 1976, my grandfather's long gone, uh, they decide we need to have a bigger hospital in Tomball. So this little community hospital that my grandfather and other men in the community and ladies in the community had gone around and sold shares of the hospital. Um, they literally sold $300 shares to the hospital. That was like primitive insurance in Tomball. If you bought a share in the hospital, you got a certain amount of health services to go with it. So 1976, the Tomball Hospital Authority is established. So they can become a taxing entity. They can go out and sell bonds and raise some funds to build a new hospital. Any of you who have been in Tomball uh, and been over by the ball fields, not far from there, there's a hospital street. Uh, many of you probably wonder, why is it called Hospital Street? That's because that's where the old hospital was, uh, off of Huffsmith. Uh, and so they moved to the new location, kind of the intersection of Teddy Vogt's Cornfield and the Stalin's Dairy, for those of you who've been around a while. And so they built, uh, in this, this field, the start of the Tomball Hospital. Well, 2011, they decide that this, this is hard to run a community hospital. And so they had the opportunity and they, they had a couple of organizations that uh, were bidding to buy the hospital. And so they sold the hospital and made a nice profit. So the state of Texas says when you break up a community hospital, you have to take that that, those funds and put them back in the community. Well, if you're out in West Texas, you buy three ambulances and you're done with your profit. Well, we had a little more than that left. And so uh, the decision was made, we're going to, I say we, they, the board, decided they would found the Tomball Regional Hospital, uh, the foundation, Tomball Regional Health Foundation with the proceeds. And then that they would run it into perpetuity and use the funds from the sale of the hospital uh, and use a certain percentage every year to put it back into the community. So what is the Tomball region? Well, we define the Tomball region as these 13 zip codes. Uh, it's kind of the historic footprint of the Tomball Hospital. So uh, I won't read those to you, but I think you, you can see uh, the areas. 
So what do we do? Well, since inception, we have put over $27 million into healthcare in the Tomball area. That's a pretty impressive number, uh, $27 million. Uh, Tomagua, uh, City of Tomball, uh, for their parks, all sorts of organizations. Uh, we do dental care, medical care, mental health, food insecurity. Uh, we do all the Meals on Wheels for these 13 zip codes. So if you have a senior who lives in Southwest Montgomery County or Northwest Harris County, they will get a free Meals on Wheels and they're gonna send us the bill. Um, health education, we are a big uh, supporter of all the health education programs at Lone Star College. Um, personal safety, we do swim lessons, uh, veteran services, senior services, special needs. So we define healthcare as a fairly broad area um, and one of the things that, since I came on board in 2022, is I wanted to broaden our area. So when I came on board, we had 27 organizations that we were supporting. Uh, right now, we're up to 39. So we're actively um, out there and engaging the community to say, here, what can we do for you? One of my favorite community uh, outreach programs, and uh, Roger Bridgewater, obviously he's in the, in, the, in the middle back there, he knows about it. Uh, we bring uh, organizations that we support together for quarterly roundtables. So they get together, they talk, they cross-pollinate their ideas. We all get so busy doing our everyday life that we, we don't always know what the person to the left or the right does. And so we bring in community leaders, uh, political leaders, and our nonprofits. We bring them together and we see what can they do when they start talking. And it's been wonderful to see how they work together. I'll give you, you know, one quick example. We had an organization that we support and they were recognizing they needed to have a mental health component to what they did. And they were going, coming to us and wanted to talk about us uh, providing a mental health counselor. And I said, I love the idea. I said, what do you know about mental health counseling? Nothing. Okay. What if you partnered with this organization that does mental health counseling? How would that work for you? Well, that would work. And so now they're partnering and so uh, instead of having one mental health counselor in an organization that doesn't know anything about mental health counseling, they're partnering with an organization that does it every day and has 18 counselors on staff. That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? And so we want to help them to be more efficient, more effective, and stretch that dollar farther. And so we do these quarterly roundtables, and what I love about it is I feel like people really see value in them. I typically invite 25 people, and I have about 32 to 35 show up. That's pretty unusual. Normally you have, what, 60% of people show up when you invite them, and we have a, usually 100 plus a percent attendance. Because people will show up and like, I know, uh, that I, I knew that he would add something to this, so I just brought him. Okay, come on. So what is our application process? You have to be nonprofit, um, and so uh, you have to align with our mission, serve our zip codes, and non-religious in nature. So although we work with organizations like Tamagua, team, SOS, that, that um, have a religious uh, foundation, we can't directly, because we're a public entity, we can't directly put money into uh, an organization's uh, religious component. So for instance, Meals on Wheels Montgomery County, we support them for our three zip codes, but we can't put money in their book program because the Bible is the biggest requested book. So we can't, we have to kind of make sure we're staying within the laws of the state of Texas. But we have no problem working with a NAM, a team, an SOS uh, that is, is supported by area churches. We have an annual window, um, and when you, so you uh, put in a letter of interest, we're gonna review that letter of interest and see if you, you fit our criteria. Then we're gonna invite you to submit, and then our board will review it and award. Uh, and so uh, here's our board of directors. It's 11 members from our community. You, if you look up there, you probably know some of them. Uh, they are all throughout the area. We have the mayor of Waller. We have people from Spring, Klein, Magnolia, uh, and all parts in between. And so uh, very proud to say that we have already committed 3.3 million for 2024 to put into the healthcare needs of our community. And so there's just a few of the people, well, all the people we support, Somehow Sarah gets everybody to fit on there, and I don't know how she does it, but she's, she's, she's amazing at this stuff. And so um, if you get a chance, if you want to follow us, we'd love to have you follow us on Facebook uh, or Instagram. Uh, there again, Sarah's doing a great job of, of making sure folks know what we do. And, uh, or you can call us. We actually answer the phone. I was talking to Joe uh, with a team, and he said, it's so easy to work with you. When I call you, you answer. And I'm like, that's, that's what we're there for. We're there to serve the community. So, I'll, so anyway, in a nutshell, that's uh, kind of what, uh, what I do. That's what our organization does. And uh, so when I'm uh, 
away from the organization. Uh, the hat I try to wear now is I try to get outside with my kids and my wife and uh, do a little hiking and hunting and things of that nature. So any questions about our organization, I can answer for you. Or general history questions that no one else will answer for you. <laughs> yes, sir, Kent. I do not believe that's the original site. Uh, and if you've noticed, the Klein School District has done a great job of telling people that you can address your letters even though it's part of the Spring Post Office, you can still address them and say Klein, Texas, and, and uh, the Klein zip code. And uh, the Klein area has really been preserved by the school district. If you look at all the schools, they're named after all the old families there. Oftentimes, uh, if that was the farm they bought, if they're on the Schindelwolf property or the Howdy property or whatever, they try to name it after, after one of those early families. So that's really cool. Any other questions? Y'all are easy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much.